Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness, Guru Maharaj. We have uh, 17 participants today, Guru Maharaj. Um, announcement which I'll make now. And then I'll make it again at the end. So starting on Saturday, this Saturday, we'll begin a four part series on Prabhupada's vision for the future of the world and for the future of the ISKCON society. Based on some of his state, most of it, mostly on his statements and and a few verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that'll begin on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday for four days. Today and tomorrow, today and tomorrow, we will uh, continue to explore that verse that we ex began yesterday the 30 qualities of the human being. And um, on Friday, we will connect with the devotees from Charlotte and do a verse from the fourth canto. So you have an idea of the next, practically almost the next week of what the different classes will be. Again, I'll repeat that at, towards the end. That's good, Mother. Thank you. So if you can, uh, again, bring up that verse that we did yesterday and we'll continue with the part that we uh, weren't able to get to or didn't get to. Uh, Guru Maharaj, um, can I know the chapter number? Um, yeah, it's uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. Om Gyanti Mirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmili Tamyainatas My Shri Guru Gana Maha Shri Chaitanya Manavistam Stapi Tamyana Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Tam Pande Ham Shiguro Shi Utapadakamalam Shigurun Vaishnavamscha Si rupam sarvaja tam sahagana dvagana tam vitam tam suchi vam. Sa dvaitam sarvadutam parijana sahitam. Krishna chaitanya devam shri radha krishna padam sahagana lalita. Shri vishakam vitam scha. Ma om vishnu padaya krishna pustaya bhutilve. Shri makti bhakti vedanta swami iti namane. Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pucharine Nirvishesa Sunyavari Pasyatya Devi Satarine Panchakalpa Tarugascha Kripa Sindhu Beva Chapatita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaisnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Daisi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadahar Sri Vasadi Gaur Vakarindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So uh, yesterday we began this particular set of verses from the seventh canto, describing the 30 qualities that are meant to be acquired by the human being in order to be, to be able to be educated to the platform of human life. We mentioned that the first 21 qualities, as you can see here from the listing, starting with uh, uh, truthfulness, uh, mercy, austerity, and onwards, um, consists of characteristics and attributes that the living entity is meant to develop along with certain activities that one must accept as supportive principles in our spiritual life. I say supportive because these things are not directly bhakti, but
but they are foundational to the practice of bhakti. Bhakti comes in these nine uh, listings here in this verse, which are mentioned as the angas of devotional service. Hearing about Krishna, uh, speaking about Krishna, remembering Krishna, offering prayers to Krishna, uh, let's see, worshiping Krishna in the form of his deity, engaging in activities uh, of worshiping Krishna by visiting various holy places, uh, serving the lotus feet, in other words, visiting holy places, uh, serving the Vaishnavas, uh, what else is in there? Uh, honoring days like Janmastami and Gaur Purnima and Ram Nomi. Um, these are all part of becoming a, uh, what is called serving the lotus feet and then becoming a servant, um, carrying out very, trying to render service is one and becoming a servant, trying to render service is serving the lotus feet. Becoming a servant is carrying out various types of duty. Becoming a friend and surrendering one's whole self, everything, body, mind, intelligence, possessions, everything in the service of the Lord. So each of these angas are fully equipped to bring one to the perfectional stage. And one may practice one or more of these angas or limbs of bhakti, but one of them is foundational to the practice of all the other eight, and that is one must chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Because in this age, the addition has been given as the means for self-realization and the support of all other activities, and that is called the Yuga Dharma, or the way to purify one's intelligence in relationship and of course, chanting of the holy names, hearing the glories of the Lord is an anga in and of itself. But if one adopts any of the other eight angas, one must accompany the, that those angas with the practice of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra according to the guidelines given by Shastra and specifically guidelines given by the spiritual master. So, um, but uh, one, one, can perf one can perfect devotional service in any of the other areas if one focuses on one type of devotional service. Just like we find that uh, Sukadev Goswami perfected chanting, Maharaj Parikshit perfected hearing, Prahlad Maharaj perfected remembering, Akura perfected off, offering prayers. Uh, Prithu Maharaj perfected uh, worshiping of the Lord in his deity form, Archana. Uh, Lakshmi Devi perfected serving the lotus feet. Hanuman perfected carrying out orders, in other words, becoming a servant. Arjuna perfected the friend, becoming a friend to the Lord. And Bali Maharaj perfected um, the... Uh, a uh, process of surrendering everything, including one's own life and everything in, in it, to the lotus feet of the Lord, surrendering everything. So we find within the Shastras there are nine angas, and as an examples of what, how these angas are executed, we can study the lives of these nine persons. Now, in order for us to engage in the, these angas or these processes, these other 21 qualities are supportive and necessary because they, they help bringing one to the mode of goodness. And the mode of goodness is where devotional service actually develops. When one is situated or performing activities in the lower modes, such as passion and ignorance, what are, the, what are those characteristics in those modes? In ignorance, one doesn't know what is right and what is wrong. One acts whimsically. 
generally causing harm to oneself and to others. takes up activities that are both either sinful or self-destructive, such as excess sleep, uh, excess sleeping, uh, intoxication, or various types of sinful activities. Of course, devotees don't do that, but sometimes we can act in the mode of ignorance by becoming bewildered and doing the wrong things, which sometimes cause harm to others. That's a symptom of the mode of ignorance. The symptom of the mode of passion is that one struggles hard in order to increase their happiness in this material world through various types of endeavors, such as inquiring money, getting a position, getting followers, um, uh, trying to present oneself in, the way, in more and more in a better light of happiness and position through one's efforts in this world. That is the mode of passion. The mode of passion is also the mode of creativity, where that, with even though it's in the mode of material energy, creativity, when it's used in the service of the Lord, can also take on some of the qualities of goodness. But generally, creativity is a feature, a feature of the intelligence and the intelligence as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 26th chapter of the third canto is in the mode of passion. Sometimes people under, wonder, well, how is the mind in the mode of goodness and the intelligence, which is higher than the mind, situated is more in the mode of passion? Because passion is active, whereas goodness is more passive. Uh, people in the mode of goodness more are more peaceful and more passive, where people in the mode of passion are more active. So, but the intelligence needs to activate the mind to move into the mode of goodness by its creative propensity and by its, uh, what we say, its ability to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. So when we take up one of these, or more than one of these activities of bhakti, we should also know that we need to support these activities in an intelligent way by, by performing the activities in these other 21 ways here. If we don't follow these other 21 ways, at least to some degree, we will find ourselves not be staying steady in our devotional service. And steadiness in devotional service is the means by which one can free themselves from wrong desires, material attachments, or just habits that cause us to divert our attention away from devotion to the Lord. To be situated fully in one of these nine processes means that one, the mind has to be somewhat purified. So the processes of self are both purifying and attained when one achieves purification. In other words, until we be actually attain purification of the mind, in other words, what is purification of the mind? Purification of the mind is when, when one is fixed in devotional service to the Lord coming in and out of the devotional service, still looking towards the material energy. Um, and this is one of the important uh, features that one the devotees have to be aware of, that the mind has a tendency to be indifferent towards Krishna consciousness. This is one of the mind's natures. It has a tendency to be indifferent towards Krishna consciousness and has an intense, uh, has a, an indifference towards um, engaging in steady activities. The mind likes to move from place to place, from object to object, from desire to desire. Uh, and it is still being affected by the waves of the material energy, even to some degree, even when it gets to the mode of goodness that indifference slightly still remains within the mind of the devotee. And therefore, one cannot, doesn't stay steady in their devotional service. 
they still look towards material life for something, some satisfaction. So only when we get free from that desire to find happiness in the material world, and how you do that is the combination of these two aspects that are presented on this particular verse we're studying here. That the qualities that are being mentioned, along with the not one or more of the angas of bhakti, then one can gradually free themselves from the tendency. We cannot come to devotional service, um, what we say, simply by trying to reject material uh, life. We have to have something positive to keep ourselves fixed in devotional service. So these underlying qualities are supportive, their characteristics and their, their, ten, their, their traits that one develops, which when one engages in devotional service, it becomes more natural to remain fixed in the process of worshiping Krishna. And of course, worshiping Krishna means to have some understanding of who Krishna is, what is his qualities, what is his attributes, how he relates to his devotee, what is his nature when he brings about the creation. Many of the qualities of Krishna in relationship to his different activities and functions, devotees need to get a working understanding of these things by regularly hearing about them. So they develop this attraction away from the tendency because we are conditioned by this material energy to have friends, activities, material things in this life. And we consider that our sometimes to some degree our support or our ways to find happiness in this world. But that will gradually be replaced by the foundation of something that is tangible because everything in this world is intangible and immutable constantly changing so there's no stability in anything material and you can see if you go through life even as your values change even in a material way you can see how how everything is always changing what we valued maybe last year as important we may not have the same value towards that object now or maybe last year we didn't have a value towards something, but now we have developed some kind of attraction and attachment to something in this, in this time period that has recently come. So everything in this material world is changing and the mind is simply a flickering object that keeps moving from place to place. Although its nature is pure, consciousness because of its association with the false ego what is that false ego the identification of the body and the things in relationship to the body when the living entity hits the material world it gets a material body and immediately one's real ego which is jivar sarupa krishna nir krishna nirnichidas i am krishna's eternal part and parcel and my my duty is to render transcendental loving service to the Lord that gets covered over by the association of matter and immediately due to our association with matter this false ego appears and we start to accept identities and activities which are the coverings that material energy dictates upon us which are I'm a woman I'm a man and from this background, in other words, anything material you can identify yourself with in relationship to the day-to-day -day activities you perform, or in a general sense, are all acquired due to our association with matter. Now, the way we overcome that, is, first of all, is to realize it's, it's not me. <laughs> it has nothing to do with me. But that realization or that uh, philosophical speculation on this principle of truth cannot give you uh, detachment from these faults, these tendencies of the false ego. 
Only when we engage in one or more of the nine processes of bhakti, supported by these 21 qualities that are mentioned here, because these qualities are of the nature of the mode of goodness. And therefore, that's the standard by which we move to sattva or transcendental consciousness, or transcendental activity, which pr pr produces a consciousness distinct from our attachments to this material world. If we're not losing our attachments to the material world, then we still need to work very regularly on performing activities and devotional service to develop that attraction for Krishna, which will gradually help us to reduce our attachments to the ephemeral material world, which has been given to us simply because we have accepted a material body. Okay, and which is the cause of all suffering also. So I'll stop there. And again, I'll just emphasize these nine angas of bhakti as the ways to perform our, our service to Krishna and develop our attraction for Krishna, supported by these other 21 qualities. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, um, thank you so much for the wonderful class once again. Um, thank you uh, very much for emphasizing on those uh, important points again, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. I request devotees if they have any questions or realizations, they can go ahead. Thank you so much. I would just like to add that to get free from material attachments and material attractions is not so easy. It's very difficult, only because of the nature of the mind and, and, be, and because of our long-term association with matter. But, uh, but that is actually the prerequisite for attaining transcendental consciousness. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, our glories to Srila Prabhupada and our glories to you. Uh, thank you very much for emphasizing uh, this, uh, this topic. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the mind uh, becomes, uh, how to say, uh, falls in, into illusion uh, when it associates the mind, uh, the false ego. And uh, somewhere I read that uh, actually the mind is uh, which which also protects the false ego. Uh, yes. So, uh, could you elaborate uh, a little bit uh, on on the the relationship between these two? Yeah, they're they're like two two uh, two bandits that rob your spiritual life. Your intelligence is your friend. When intelligence is guided by higher authorities, uh, when the intelligence is like the mind or, or is influenced by the false ego, then you have three enemies, and the senses simply follow those these these other personalities. So the yeah the false ego is anything we identify ourselves in the materialistic way, and all the things that we possess in our life are extensions of the of the initial part of the false ego which is uh the mind principle the i principle is the false ego the mind principle is an, is a lesser form of the same false ego now the mind um wants to still the mind has this tendency to enjoy sometimes indiscriminately it will not it will sometimes look for enjoyment even outside the purview of what is acceptable and that's the conditioned mind of course and so therefore in order to fortify that that um, uh, desire the mind will refer to the false ego in order to what we say validate that in other words um, I have, you know, I'm going to enjoy this because this is me. And I, this is what I like. 
this is who I am. This is my identity. In other words, um, uh, you can take it to the extreme, just like you find two cultures are at war with each other. So I remember for many, many years, and maybe even today to some degree, uh, the uh, battle between the Jews and the Pal Palestinians, which was a, a long-term fight that went on for years and years and years and had history, had much history behind it. Uh, so people would automatically identify with the idea that I am one of these cultures and therefore I automatically don't like that other culture because of my identity. So that's the mind using the false ego to justify how I'm supposed to act in this situation. You may not even know anything about the other culture. All you know is that you are against it. <laughs> or if you do have some knowledge, it is insignificant to really come up with any kind of reason uh, unless what you hear from others, in other words. So this idea of coming to the hate principle is simply the mind justifying its position in relationship to the sense of false ego, which identifies itself with the body. That's an example. Thank you very that, much. It's... Was that clear? Yes, yes. Uh, I just uh, had this uh, uh, follow-up question during uh, during that. That uh, after all, um, it's is it possible to to make our uh, uh, our mind our friend? Because uh, as I as I remember, it was stated in in the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, when the mind is engaged in devotional service, then the mind is a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. The last line I can't remember. So this, uh, one should elevate themselves by the mind and not degrade themselves. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy is a, as well. So when you elevate your mind to the to the activities of devotional service, the mind becomes a friend. When the mind is not, then it will act in all kinds of materialistic ways to pull the soul away from its connection to Krishna, mm. using the false ego to justify it. Another example of false ego is, um, I may do something and it turns out to be successful and other people um, um, acknowledge that, yeah, I get some alkaloids, I get some benefits, I get some praise. So then I ident identify with the activity as being done by me. And therefore I take, I take the credit. That's the false ego. The false ego is the one I want. The mind wants to take the false ego by justifying themselves that I am the doer. Well, yeah, it it happens quite a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's but you have to understand from the from Shastra what what is actually the reality. We are bewildered by the material energy, but we shouldn't accept bewilderment as being the standard by which we live by. Bewilderment is simply a feature of the material energy because the material energy is governed by the, the, the principle of hiding Krishna. And therefore, one is always bewildered. We have to use the material energy in the service of the Lord to help reveal and then that same bewildering energy uh, reveals Krishna instead of hiding Krishna. Thank you very much. Uh, just for uh, clarif clarification, if I uh, understood properly, so the false ego is always an enemy, 
and the mind and the intelligence intelligence can be enemy or friend but it's easier to make the friend the intelligence guided by guru sadhu shastra and uh, yeah. by the help of yeah. intelligence the mind can be a friend also yeah the mind has an indifference towards krishna mm. but the, the, the intelligence can be trained by shastra by guru shastra sadhu to um, become engaged in pushing the mind towards Krishna. And that means the senses, I mean, the intelligent actually connects with the senses through the mind. When the mind is connected with the, with the uh, direction of this, the intelligence. We always talk about mind and senses, but the senses can be activated through the mind when the intelligence is, is you know, acting on the spiritual or uh, on the principle of truth. Mm -hmm. This is a little philosophical, but it's important to understand that our friend is the intelligence and uh, we have the, the direct connection between the soul and the intelligence. The mind doesn't have that direct connection, but the, the mind can be connected through the intelligence. Thank you very intelligence, much. Intelligence is your saving grace. Therefore, um, we have sources of intelligence. It's not, there are different kinds of intelligence. They're the intelligence that we use to live in the day-to-day -day world, how to do things in this world. That's a form of intelligence. How to protect ourselves, how to perform our material activities, that's a form of intelligence. But another aspect of the intelligence is to elevate the mind and senses to the transcendental platform through the words of the scriptures and guru. So that has to be understood, or at least to some degree, where we can apply this knowledge in relationship to the mind's activities. <laughs> if we don't, then the mind will just have a tendency to do what it wants. It just, it just keeps moving from thing place to place. That's the mind. Intelligence can be more fixed because it has a, a greater sense of discrimination. That. It's a higher feature of the mind, but it's more active than the mind. The mind is more of an, in a passive state. Thank you so much. It's it's uh, much, much more clear now. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Manisha, Hare Krishna, welcome. Dandavat Pranam. I wanted to just say that um, your uh, teachings from yesterday's lecture, where you had pointed out um, uh, going along with this uh, shloka, that, um, you know, like the lust, you know, come, like getting that under control, like a gawking is also very important for devotees to be very careful like a women should not check out men and men should not check out women. You know, just like Srila Prabhupada Ji taught that, you know, we should call everyone mother and the men should look at every other female other than their wife as their mother. I mean, of course, uh, except for their daughters, but you know, every other female should be looked at as a mother. And same goes for the female devotees that they should look at every other male, you know, as Prabhuji. So thank you again for pointing that out yesterday. Hare Krishna. Well, Prabhupada clarifies that position of Prabhupada. He said the women should look at the men as sons. Because if you refer to a woman as mother, then her relationship to everything is the men are sons. And so there is a, more like a, a nurturing 
relationship instead of a sensual or physical re physical relationship. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Guru Maharaj, if you can please speak a little bit to um, how, you know, Guru, like we should uh, uh, pray and respect Guru as our connection to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, yes, prasada, bhagavad prasada, yes, yes, prasada, nagati kutopi. That the instructions of the spiritual master is the foundation for connection with Krishna. And so that the business of the spiritual master is to connect us with Krishna in devotion. So his instructions, which take the form of philosophical teachings and practical guidance, and both of those things are two features of the spiritual master's service to the disciple to guide philosophically and to give practical understanding on how to live life in such a way that they can make progress. So um, we, it's one should see the spiritual master, the disciple should see the spiritual master on the same level he sees the Lord. And Prabhupada mentioned that in one of his first lectures that he ever gave back in 1966 in New York. One should relate to the spiritual master as God. And the spiritual master never thinks he's God, but one should see that God has come in the form of the spiritual master to accept our service and then to offer it. So the spiritual master is called Servitor Godhead, and the Supreme Lord is service uh, is is Godhead who is served. So there was Godhead. There's Godhead who is serving and Godhead who is served. So that title is given to the spiritual master, and the understanding can be taken another way, is or another or in the same way is that as an ambassador comes on behalf of the leader of his country to another country. He is giving respects as if the leader of that country were personally present. So in the same way, well, we uh, accept the spiritual master as being the representative of God, and therefore he is seen and treated in that same way. He doesn't think he's God. If he does, he's fallen. He just accepts the service of, this, of the uh, disciple and passes that service on to the Supreme Lord. Thing. That's why we, we chant this verse, Yasya Prashada, Bhagavad Prashado, Yasya Prashadan, Nagati Kutopi. By his mercy, one gets the mercy of Krishna. So, uh, how to serve the spiritual master? That, that's another topic, but the best form of service, even if one doesn't do anything personally to serve, one should very carefully understand the instructions and uh, understand carefully how to carry them out also. So what makes the spiritual master happy is when they, he sees the disciple making advancement in spiritual life. The gifts and the various things that are given to the spiritual master and throughout the relationship are secondary they're just ways that the, the disciple can show their appreciation for the spiritual master. But the real connection is through the instructions. And that's what inspires the spiritual master to open up the knowledge that the disciple needs when he sees that, this, that the disciple is very sincere in becoming Krishna conscious. Sincere means that he's trying, she's trying her best to execute the instructions in a day-to-day -day way. <laughs> Thank you so much for clarifying, Guru Maharaji. That is what I had uh, believed, but you know, coming you know in discussion with various devotees, then so, some others they may uh, not have the same idea. So I just wanted to clarify. Thank you so much. And I will make sure to always refer to that first lecture of Srila Prabhupada, as you mentioned. Uh, just lastly, I wanted to ask uh, in reference to what you have just instructed. 
is that, um, you know, the vows that we take during our first initiation in front of the fire, right? It's the soul holy sacrifice, like, uh, you know, our Guru Maharaj gives us Diksha, and we take initiation and we make some promises as a fire we keep as a witness, right? And yep. we say that we are going to, yes, Guru Maharaj, you know, we will follow all of your instructions. And we promise that from this day forward, I mean, we've already been practicing. That's, you know, when Guru Maharaj accepts you, you've already been practicing all those principles. Guru Maharaj watches you and makes sure that, you know, at least for one year, make sure that you're following all those principles. And then Guru agrees to give you Diksha. Now at the fire sacrifice uh, initiation ceremony, you know, uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, you, you as the initiated disciple make the promise that, you know, along with other things, I promise I will chant 16 rounds minimum daily, no matter what. I, my question is, what are the repercussions of not following that promise? Well, along with that promise of 16 rounds is the four regulative principles. So Prabhupada speaks about this. He says, when you fall below the standard in relationship to your chanting, you suffer. You've made a vow and now you've gone below and you're not getting the mercy because the instruction is there, you're below the standard. So that's called disobey, disobeying the order of the spiritual master, which was one of the offenses against the holy name of the Lord. In other words, it will, will make it difficult for us to make any progress at all. But the spiritual master doesn't suffer. Now, if you break one, of the, one or more of the regulative principles on a regular basis, then both the disciple and the spiritual master get a reaction from that. So that's more severe. So the spiritual master has to see bad dreams or he has to get undergo some physical suffering due to that. And the disciple will also undergo some difficulty, some suffering. So we encourage people to follow both of those categories of promises for their own benefit. And also if they have any regard for the spiritual master, they will keep their promise because it's not a promise, it's actually a vow. Initiation is not initiation promise, initiation vow. Sometimes in day-to-day -day life, we make a promise, but circumstances come up and we are forced to break the promise due to the circumstances. But a vow can never be broken. A vow stays, is something that we determine to do no matter what the situation is. And so initiation is initiation vow. So those who are falling below the standard will obviously cause themselves difficulty and will not be able to make an, a, practically no spiritual advancement because they're committing that offense of disobeying the instructions. Thank you so much again, Guru Maharaji, for clarifying. This is exactly what I had in mind and I wanted to hear it from you. So thank you so much, um, because that is what I understood that, you know, your Guru Maharaj is representative of God for you. And the vows that you take, you have to take very seriously if you are initiated, especially. And if you do not, uh, you know, follow those principles and you're not chanting your 16 rounds each and every day regularly, then your Guru Maharaj can suffer not only you can suffer, but your Guru Maharaj can also suffer due to that. So thank you again for clarifying. And just as a reminder for myself that we have to be very, very cautious in following these uh, principles and regulations so that we do not cause any uprag towards our Guru and God. Hare Krishna. Thank you. I would like just like to add that in general, aside from these two of categories of vows at initiation, the instructions of the spiritual master are not optional. Many times devotees will, don't even follow the instructions of the spiritual master because they either feel like it's too difficult or doesn't apply to them. 
In other words, this is one of the features of this age we live in, that the, people, the disciples do not take the instructions to heart, which is required in order to, to uh, purify the heart and make advancement in devotional service. And that's why Guru Maharaj, we in particular are so extremely blessed that we are getting this opportunity to associate with you daily, get our daily reminders, our spiritual energy from you, get our shiksha from you, be in your association, in your service. Because I know so many disciples, unfortunately, either their Guru Maharaj has left this planet or even if their Guru Maharaj is still on this planet, they have no way of associating with them. So the link is broken, unfortunately, and they're not getting the shiksha or those reminders. Mm -hmm. Well, they can re keep reading Prabhupada's books if they, that will help them to stay connected to, to a large degree, but still the relationship should continue it's a very personal relationship and it's not something just formalized. <laughs> yeah, and the more personal that relationship becomes, the more the, the spiritual master reveals more and more about the disciple to the disciple, which will help that disciple make more and more advancement and gain more and more knowledge at the same time. This is a very, uh, what we say, uh, variegated topic. There's money angles from guru disciple relationship. It's something that we can, there's books written about it and there's hundreds and thousands of speeches made and made about it. So one should um, make that the, the most important thing in your life, how to strengthen that relationship. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, whatever we can do here is all by the grace of Srila Prabhupada. Jay Srila Prabhupada, thank you. Hare Krishna. So um, we'll take more questions, but I'll be right back because I have to take the off offering off the altar and I'll be back in one minute. Okay. Dear Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. Thank you so much for continuing this series of lectures on developing these 21 supportive qualities because we tend to focus only on the bhakti aspect and we don't realize that the supportive aspect is very, very important. So thank you very much for uh, emphasizing. My question is actually leading off uh, Manisha Mataji's uh, questions and uh, her comments. This uh, vow that we take at initiation that I will chant my 16 rounds, I will follow the four regulated principles after some time, uh, we tend to think that, oh, it's okay if I don't chant, it's all right. And when you talk to people, they say, yeah, I'm not really chanting, but now I'm so far back that I don't even think that I can make up, so I just give up. And when we tell the Prabhu, you've taken initiation, you have to chant your rounds, please. How, what can we do to help? They say, oh, don't worry. You're so fanatical, you're so uptight, relax, chill, cool. Be cool, you know, it's okay. I'm fine. I'm not suffering. 
Nothing is happening to me. So what do you do when when you have people like this? <laughs> well, what is our interest in in trying to help them? I mean, if they can't be helped, then what can you do? There's an old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Someone is resistant. You may think of different ways to reach them, but if they remain resistant, then you just move on to other areas where people are more open and more uh, inclined to hear. So for, for people who are not connected to their spiritual master or to the process, you know, they're covered over by Maya. And one of the principles of Maya is that it makes you forget what devotional service is like. And Maya has two potencies. It's called, one is called covering and one is called throwing. She makes the living entity forget and then she throws them outside of devotional service. And because we forget and because we're not following, uh, we think everything is okay. In other words, we're in, a, in, a, in, a, in the illusion of happiness or the illusion that everything is okay. So uh, what to do? Well, you have to see what is your relationship with that individual. And based on that relationship, if you are still thinking that there is some hope that they will change, you can explore different avenues. But generally, if a person is resistant, then let them suffer. And then maybe when they suffer enough, they'll wake up. They, just like they say, if you want to make a fire, you make a fire. And if you want to burn it really fast, you want to keep the fire burning, you pour, you pour ladles of ghee on it and the fire will keep going. But if you take a bucket of ghee and pour it on the fire, it'll go out. <laughs> so when they reach the bottom, when, they're, when they just crash down far enough, then they might think, oh my God, what happened? So yeah, Manisha has made a nice point. You can pray for them because the power of prayer is also, also very much instrumental in getting them back to their, you know, standard. If Krishna hears your prayer, he will maybe do something. Just like sometimes we see a person goes completely outside of devotional service. So we just pray, not pray, but we hope that they get smashed. So they'll wake up by getting smashed and come running back. You know? We don't like to see anyone get smashed, but if it works for their benefit, then yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hi. Hare Krishna, anybody else have any questions? Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have a question. Um, I always get confused uh, with this uh, aspect of mode of goodness and passion. Uh, suppose when we are doing any service to uh, the spiritual master and uh, Krishna, so we, we like to be enthusiastic and uh, uh, we want to give our own our best towards that service. And some people say that, uh, um, that uh, it's not in the mode of goodness, it's in the mode of passion. So um, how to understand this, Guru Maharaj? But I think that uh, whenever we do any service, um, but it, we are not doing for ourselves. It, we are doing for Krishna. We are doing for spiritual master. 
That's the difference. When you do it for yourself, that's the mode of passion. When you do it for Krishna, it's either in the mode of goodness or it's on the transcendental platform, depending on what you absorbed in that service. So passion means self, self-centeredness. That's what it means. Performing an activity with the idea of getting uh, some material benefit from the activity. So in, in, in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is, a, there is devotional service in the mode of ignorance, devotional service in the mode of passion, and devotional service in the mode of goodness, and then transcendental devotional service. So how can devotional service be in any of the three modes? Well, it really is indicating that it's tinged by certain qualities and activities that represent these different modes. The devotional service is always transcendental. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact chapter. It's Kapila Dev's instructions to his mother, Devahuti. I think it's on the chapter entitled Devotional Service. I think it might be chapter 27 in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, I'll read to that. Uh, yeah. But some people will say, say like, um, like you are in mode of passion, you are very passionate, Mataji. So at that time, I don't know what to answer them. So, um, Passion, maybe they're looking at your external way of doing things and they think you are motivated by, you know, high energy and, you know, a lot of external movements. But that doesn't necessarily indicate passion. You know, Arjuna had to fight on behalf of Krishna when he fought on behalf of Krishna. I mean, fighting is, is a very passionate activity, no doubt. But he wasn't in passion, he was in transcendence. So, yeah. But if you lose control of your senses while you're performing devotional service, then then you could also fall into the the effects or the characteristics of one of the modes. So one has to keep very good control of the mind and senses and then direct that mind and senses to towards you know serving the Lord, serving the Lord's devotee. Srila Rupa Goswami gives the definition of what is devotional service. Ayan 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 Vila Sita Sunya Jnana Karman Anandritam Anukalena Krishna Silanam Bhakti Uttamam. The devotional service has to be free from the desire of fruitive activities and for, and for gain by philosophical speculation. It has to be in relationship to Krishna and it has to be done with a desire to please the Lord. That is pure devotional service. Rupa Goswami explains that in his introduction to Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Nectar Devotion. So if you know this verse, then you can see what is devotional service, or what is pure devotional service, and what is devotional service that is less than pure. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, um, but one more thing, Guru Maharaj, like you were mentioning about uh, passiveness in the mode of goodness. So um, if suppose one is, one is in passive, um, how can they be enthusiastic to do some services or uh, to do the devotional service? Could I'm just saying that the, that's the nature of the mind. The mind is more in a passive state. Mm -hmm. The intelligence is more active. The intelligence can activate the mind to perform activities in, in devotion. But if the mind is activated by its own sense, it has a, ten a tendency to be indifferent to Krishna due to its association with matter. Okay. It's good, Mahesh. No, I understood. Thank you so much, good, Mahesh, for clarifying. Um, 
Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances of glories to Srila Prabhupada and to you. Um, does it uh, affect somehow um, if we act in a mood of uh, goodness or passion when we uh, chant our rounds properly with intention and uh, in the morning hours? Does it change with time or, or uh, does it help? Um, can you repeat the question again? I, I miss something. If we chant our rounds in the morning hours in Brahma Muhurt or before the day starts, if that helps to decrease uh, mood of passion? Uh, well, according to Shastra, the day is divided into the three modes from two o'clock a.m. to 10 o'clock a.m. the mode of goodness is prominent from 10 a.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. the mode of passion is prominent and from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. the mode of ignorance is prominent. Prominent doesn't mean exclusive, it means that's, that's the tendency of the modes during these times of the day. So when you chant during the mode of goodness then the mind is less encumbered by the day's activities. So that would mean that we act in a mode of uh, goodness? Uh, it means, it means the, atmos the atmosphere around you is more goodness. Uh -huh. okay. It's simply the atmosphere, the material energy. That's why demons, demons always flourish at night because just like when you, uh, if you take, if you hear that pastime of uh, uh, Varahadev fighting with uh, Hiranyaksha, uh, when it was coming to the, the, the evening time, the demigods were getting worried because he, Ranyaksha was getting stronger as the, as the, so demons become more stronger at night and devotees become more devotional. Tendency is in the morning because of the influence of the external energy, that's all. Thank you so much. That's why, yeah, all, all sages, they do their, generally they do their sadhana early in the morning and they do some at night too to counteract the influence of the mode of ignorance thank you very much that's mm -hmm. very very nice instruction Gurmaraj, we are uh, uh, one hour um, uh, crossed one hour, Gurmaraj. So we're okay. We completed our one hour. So thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions, we'll end here. And tomorrow we'll do this verse again, and then Friday we'll do the class with the devotees in Charlotte <laughs> from the fourth canto, thirty-first chapter. I'm not sure of the verse at this point. And then on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, we'll do a four-part series and Prabhupada's vision for ISKCON, ISKCON. Okay, thank you very much. All glories to the assembled devotees, Vanshakalpa, Thiruvishya. Ibasindu, Baba Japa Titanam, Bhavane Gil, Vaishnavi Gil, Thank you. Thank you so much for the class.